It's been over 11 years since the release of James Wan and Lee Winnell's Insidious, and I think if there is one film that perfectly summarises the last decade or so of Western mainstream horror, it is undoubtedly this one. Insidious tells the story of the Lambert family, who move into a new home only to begin experiencing threatening supernatural occurrences, which escalate into something more violent and uh, insidious after their son Dalton falls into an unexplained coma that tears the family apart. They eventually seek the help of a psychic called Elise, who explains that Dalton is trapped in a spiritual realm called the Further, which is home to something truly demonic. Now, I have a personal affinity for this film because it has lived persistently in my mind since the day I saw it in theatres and became largely responsible for reigniting my love for the genre to the point it is today. For me, Insidious is beloved imperfection. At the time, I remember leaving the theatre calling it one of the most extraordinarily unique and spine-chilling American horrors I had ever seen, so much so that I immediately went home and got lost down a rabbit hole of horror classics. Although, in retrospect, I cannot say I agree with my adrenaline-blinding reaction, as we'll come to see, but I would still make the case that it arguably gave Western mainstream horror a much-needed reawakening after what I consider an overly miserable period of mean-spirited horrors banking off the splatter torture porn craze that Juan and Winnell saw indirectly helped popularize. Hell, while I'm on it, you have to commend Juan and Winnell for essentially pioneering two of the most significant commercial trends in 21st century horror, with the addition of Juan's work on The Conjuring, which itself became its own unstoppable juggernaut. However, what makes Insidious just a little bit more special in my eyes is that it encouraged, or rather proved, that horror movies could return to their more playful and experimental roots without losing mainstream appeal, even showing fearlessness to embrace the camp and quirk that was dearly missing for quite some time. In other words, I think Insidious helped make horror movies fun again, and I think without it we wouldn't have the height levels of creativity and ambition that seem to have re-emerged ever since. That's not to say it was a genre game changer by any means, but you can't deny it had some reaching influence. Now, to put it into context, Insidious was another anomaly of sorts, because at the time the trend was either torture porn, fine footage or possession movies, and it somehow managed to bypass these commercially reliable concepts thanks to working very diligently within a strikingly low $1.5 million budget. Bear in mind, this was the second film that helped propel Blumhouse's reputation for low-risk, high-reward productions after the success of Paranormal Activity, and so you really cannot underestimate how prominent Insidious was to effectively helping indie horror movies, especially weird and unconventional ones, become mainstream global moneymakers. In the long-term domino effect, if it weren't for Insidious' success, there would be no way in hell Warner Brothers would trust James Wan with $40 million to make whatever the fuck Malignant was. Anyway, the reason for this video is to simply revisit what made Insidious so alluring and memorable to begin with, because it somehow found a way to tread a line between eerie and macabre and absolute batshit insanity. By the way, I will not be addressing the three sequels, and instead will simply be isolating the original for contextual purposes. If I'm honest, I haven't properly sat down and gave them my undivided attention, and while they have some brilliantly creepy creature designs, the magic has kind of worn off when you consider the crazy stuff that's been made ever since. Lastly, shameless self-promotion, if you enjoyed this video please like and comment below, perhaps subscribe for more horror movie content, and if you're feeling generous, why not consider supporting the show on Patreon? Right, let's move on. To be honest, I actually find it incredibly daunting to pick where to begin, because there's a chaotic energy to Insidious that's really difficult to summarize. 
I still think calling it experimental is fair game to some extent because you can definitely see James Wan honing his craft before perfecting it in The Conjuring soon after. His direction has only escalated without ever losing its giddy, energetic consistency, but with Insidious, its imperfections really add to its charm because it's not as self-serious as The Conjuring and its debt to old-school trickery and relishing in deceiving and surprising the audience never fails to put a smile on my face. Granted, you have to greatly suspend your disbelief because the word grounded does not exist here. If you think there is such a thing as elevated horror, well, this movie is elevated out the fucking window. In fact, it very deliberately goes out of its way to behave like a child's overactive imagination. You basically have to set your expectations according to the first 20 or so seconds because it sets the hyper dramatic tone pretty firmly and if after the title card you scrunch your face even just a little, yeah, this one ain't for you, buddy. Hell, in its time, I remember it took quite a bit of adjusting to this style because there were very few other modern mainstream horrors indulging in such a pure theatrical aesthetic. If anything, Insidious felt like it was carrying the remnants of the early to mid 2000s supernatural craze, almost seemingly lampooning its campiness. Heck, I remember hearing people say this was exactly what Malignant was trying to homage, and while I do agree with that, it all comes back down to how our culture constantly revises what is actually scary in the moment. I don't think it always works effectively, especially in its second half, but the balance between the mundane and ordinary and the increasingly carnival vaudevillian-esque madness will absolutely make or break it for you. I did not know this until writing the script, but Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly highlighted that much of Insidious' inspiration actually came from the 1962 horror Carnival of Souls, which I've never heard of, but frankly, that explains everything in the most literal way possible. I was thinking kinda William Castle, House on Haunted Hill type influences, which still wouldn't surprise me if it were true because Insidious is shamelessly gimmicky and hokey in a self-aware fashion, but it helps that I have a high tolerance to that type of schlock, so it does make Insidious somewhat of an acquired taste, if you couldn't tell by now. I think that's why people generally prefer The Conjuring because it more directly tries to modernize and re-authenticate that classical style of 60s horror with conviction, whereas Insidious feels like it's just toying around, and as a result, I got the sense that they made some stuff up as they went along. Now, the other extremely evident influence that we'll come across when we talk about the story in more detail is 1982's Poltergeist because the plot is virtually the same. We have the family haunted by absurd shenanigans, there's an eccentric medium and her goofy goons, and then of course there's a spirit realm in which one parent must pass through to save their child. Hell, just to consolidate that, Insidious even has a nod to Poltergeist with the raw meat. It isn't so much a love letter to the genre, more than it is a borderline Tarantino-esque collage of influences that get more and more ridiculous the longer you think about it. The thing is, it's really hard to compress Insidious because it's so preposterous yet has a way of really involving you in its madness by giving you almost no breathing room to truly stop and digest what is actually going on. From the get-go, I find the film perpetually stressful because of how overwhelming and spontaneous its sudden bursts of horror typically are. I find most of the jump scares work because you're utterly unprepared for them. There are very few times when things are telegraphed and it creates that explosive theatrical reaction that's clearly designed to be watched with other people because you all gleefully share in that same reaction. You can certainly see how Wan built off dead silence by never center framing the camera. As such, there's always something off frame catching your attention, whether it be as simple as the light from the window or the constantly open doors. Your eyes are always hunting for something that is just never there, which is played off the opening title sequence of the ghosts caught in photographs. You are always set up to anticipate the crescendo because the suspense is unending, and anytime you do drop your guard, you get hit with stuff like this. 
That is perhaps one of the greatest jump scares I have ever experienced. It's so out of left field, yet it's actually built up really well. There's just nothing about the bright mundane setup that prepares you for that surprise. Don't worry, we will come back to that prick later, but until then, let's talk about the characters. The human drama is pretty light for the most part, but for the style of film, it does everything to an adequate level that's necessary to facilitate the scares. This is where its debt to Poltergeist really shows itself, because both Josh and Renee are almost identical characterizations to the parents in that film, with Patrick Wilson in particular channeling an uncanny resemblance to Craig Nelson. In fact, I take back what I said about the film not having a groundedness to it, because because the more I think about it, Wilson and Rose Byrne really bring the film back down to earth after dealing with all the surrounding eccentricities. In one of the only rare scenes to take place outside the house, there's a moment where Josh and Renee essentially show their vulnerability over struggling to cope with the uncertainty of their ill child. There's a tangible sense that they're really suppressing how tormented and desperate they are for some sort of miracle, with Josh falling into cynicism and almost wanting to stay away from the house that causes him so much pain. While the film almost borders on soap opera territory at some points, the ensuing melancholy in the middle section is reinforced by the constant empty space that makes the family seem more and more distant from each other. Probably my favourite characters are Tucker and Specs, the latter of whom is played by the film's screenwriter Lee Winnell. They both effectively consolidate the film's charming playfulness as there's a restraint placed on how oddball they're allowed to be. They never become a cartoonish parody of ghost hunters. There's a sincerity to them, a real giddy curiosity that one always loves to talk about. If anything, it is a tribute to ghost hunting because it relishes in geeking out on it. Lastly, Elise is much more subdued than I was expecting, but she brings a necessary calmness to the chaos while also having a mysterious allure about her, most notably in how she seemingly sees things we cannot. I know she became a fan favourite in the sequels, but I simply like that she is quite ambiguous and doesn't become some crazy scene-chewing character. Right, so from here on out, we are going into ending spoilers, so consider this your final warning. I'm pretty divided on how I feel about the final act. The twist midway into the story that it's not the heist that's haunted, it's Dalton, is novel in answering the age-old question, why can't the characters just beal the fuck out of there? Like Poltergeist, just the mere idea that their child is lost alone in some dangerous spiritual realm is terrifying in its own right, but whereas Poltergeist left the whole purgatory thing mysterious with only a few ghoulish hints at what's in there, Insidious just dives headfirst into it to very mixed results. The further is just not as compelling as it thinks it is. Atmospherically, it's creepy as all hell, with its weird hollow dollhouse dreamscape feel, and the sort of volatile trickster appearances of the violent spirits does perpetuate an unending sense of dread, but when it comes down to it, it's just not as imaginative as my brain wants it to be. We learn that Dalton inherited the ability to astral travel out of his own body from Josh, who experienced it when he was Dalton's age after this mysterious woman in black tried to possess his body to enter the living realm. On its own, it's a really great idea that the ability is essentially this family curse that leaves them exposed to restless, dangerous spirits, kind of like the sixth sense, but without the nuance. With Dalton, he's basically haunted by his own unique spirit known as the Lipstick Demon, which sounds fucking ridiculous, and it is, but that first impression is so ingrained in my skull that it gave me nightmares. However, while I truly respect what they tried to do with escalating the action and to give this creature a true payoff, I think they absolutely botched its full reveal. The rising absurdity does not match the total pivot into pantomime, and this is the major problem that becomes more noticeable the more times you rewatch it. 
Insidious fundamentally feels like a recording of a stage production. The artifice becomes increasingly noticeable, and with the lipstick demon in particular, not only does it show way too much, but ends up doubling down on the problem with a CGI shot that really did not need to be there. Seeing it explode on screen for just a few seconds is perfect, but I really did not need to see its goddamn hooves. It makes a genuinely horrible horrifying creature appear as nothing more than a guy in a costume, and Sinister had the exact same problem as does the Conjuring spin-offs and so on. Hell, the original Alien is arguably dated for this exact same reason and it's over 30 years older. In short, stop fucking showing us everything. It works when they're creepily used in the background or in brief appearances, but the more I see it, the more desensitized I ultimately become to it. However, thankfully, it does make up for it in the very last moment. The ending simply fits the core conceit of the movie's title. It catches you off guard because of how little attention is placed on the subplot surrounding Josh and the woman in black. When we learn from Josh's mother that the woman kept getting closer and closer to him as he got older, Josh does eventually take a moment to confront her in the further, in one of those face your fears type scenes and you just automatically assume that he overcomes it. But like Dead Silence, it's completely futile because upon returning to the living world, Elise discovers that the woman has now fully possessed Josh's body and the movie ends with Josh murdering Elise and Renee discovering that the woman is in a photograph in place of Josh. It's mean in a way that's kind of obvious. It mocks you by saying, come on, you should have seen this coming. The movie is plagued with a hopelessness to stop the spirits tormenting the family. It's literally inescapable right from the very beginning. And even though Elise helps them save Dalton, she never once claims that she can actually stop the spirits for good. It perfectly hits home the point about ghost stories in general that I think the Amityville horror did so well. There's an inherent nihilism where evil shit just exists and you kinda have to accept it and learn to live with it. And really, isn't that not the most horrifying thing of all? I know the cliffhanger was resolved in the sequel, but until that came out, this was a right kick in the teeth that perfectly bookended exactly what Insidious is. So until next time, stay safe, stay away from Insidious things, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye!